So, brothers and sisters, friends at Home Church Langley, uh, it's good to be back. It's a joy and a privilege. Just going to make it a little closer. There you go. To be um, able to share God's word with you. It's been almost a year uh, since I was last here, I think last July, and what a year it's been for our family, and we really appreciate your prayers through the House of Prayer for our daughter Stephanie and for Evelyn and for for our family. And so this morning, uh, we're in Psalm 78, and um, it's uh, amazing for me to see how the Lord has been uh, preparing us through our worship, the songs we've sang, the children's uh, lesson that Pastor Jim gave about God's mercy, uh, to bring us to this point where we will now come into God's word and, and hear what he has to say to us, not just to say to us, but what he wants us to do in our lives so that we can align our lives with what God's doing. So let's pray again and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful deeds. We thank you for your precious word and the freedom we have to just read it, enjoy it, study it here in this country, which we don't take for granted. And we thank you that we've gathered together as body of Christ, whether we're here or by Zoom this morning. And thank you that through your spirit, through the songs, through everything that's been happening, you've been speaking to us and calling us to come near to you. So now as we come into your word, continue to speak to us, open our spiritual eyes and ears and give us soft hearts willing to not just listen, but to obey. For we ask and pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Our story, my story, your story, God's story. Psalm 78. It's the second longest psalm, 72 verses, after Psalm 119. I told Pastor Jim, it's too bad it was not Psalm 119. Oh, I'll just ask us to read responsively, and then I'll ask Pastor Jim to give the benediction, and that'll be it. <laughs> Second longest. Uh, it's, a song, it's a song. We believe it was meant, it was sung. Uh, we'll, we're reading it, but it's a song about Israel's early history co composed by Asaph, who is one of the Levites appointed by King David as worship leader for the tabernacle. And like David, he was a very skilled singer and poet. And, and it covers or recounts Israel history from the Exodus, and you'll see, <laughs> I hope you like this uh, art here, from the Exodus where you see the chain being broken, uh, uh, to all the way to the beginning of the kingdom period. Uh, to David, the second king, because the first king is Saul. So it covers most of the events in the book of Exodus, uh, quite a big chunk of numbers, uh, Deuteronomy, and of course it zips by Joshua, Judges, to Kings. All right, so that's where it kind of goes, from Exodus to just maybe the first little thing sticking on the crown <laughs> of the kingdom period of Israel's history. And then some of you at this point say, wait a minute, uh, how does Israel history relate? For example, to me, um, I'm not of Jewish descent. Uh, that's their history. It's interesting for me to know, but does it relate to me? Well, uh, Pastor Jim already mentioned that uh, it does. And for the Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the believers at the church in Corinth, most of which were Gentiles, some Jews, but mostly Gentiles, he spoke like it was their history. So, so I have on good authority that Apostle Paul says, this is, this is history that's ours too, and we need to pay attention. And, and I, I won't read all of it now, but referring to this, uh, especially the wilderness rebellion, Paul says they were written for us who are on the other side of the cross, right? We now on the other side of the cross and, and as a warning. They are examples, they are examples 
uh, so that we do not set our hearts on the evil things as they did. Warning. And then Paul ends this section says, if you think you are standing firm, be careful. Be careful that you don't fall. So I take this to heart because it's for us, it's for me, it's for, 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 for you, and especially if you think you're doing fine. <laughs> be careful, the Apostle Paul says. So we could call it warnings from Israel's history. And this is how Aesop start the song. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I'm not going to read all of this because Lynette just read it to us so beautifully and well earlier. But it's here for our reference, right? Um, I will open my mouth parable, utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. So right away, you know that this is very familiar stuff for Aesop's audience. They've heard this, you could say, ad infinitum. <laughs> okay, it's nothing new. But what he says is, listen carefully, don't hide it from your children, from your grandchildren, from the next generation, because we need to not just hide it, we need to tell it, we need to share it. Share what? Well, we need to share the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power, and the wonders he has done. Those are all kind of connected if you think about it, because whatever God does is powerful. It's going to be wonderful. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. All right? Um, but anything else they need to share? Uh, yeah, verse 5. God not only did amazing, powerful stuff, he also said a lot of stuff. And, and, and Asaph summarized that as statutes for Jacob, the law in Israel. If we summarize it, it will be the Ten Commandments, but it's more than Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are part of the 613 civil and moral laws that God gave to his people to govern how they live their lives. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Exodus, that was the first thing God did when he freed them from Pharaoh. He brought them to Mount Sinai to say this stuff to them. That's how important it was. All right? All this promised land stuff, that's secondary. Uh, you're my people. I've, I've kept my promise to your ancestors, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Now listen to what I want to tell you. And that's why verse 5 is very important too. So we not only share the deeds, wonderful deeds of the Lord, we tell them what the Lord's, what the law of the Lord is. And, and, um, and if you do this, certain things would happen. Then you and your children, your grandchildren, your, your generation and their generation would put their trust in God, would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. And then says, won't be like the previous generation, their ancestors. A stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. In other words, pay attention. Carry out what I'm singing and telling you if you don't want to repeat the mistakes. All right, so I put it sort of in a table form. So... Pay attention, carry out this instruction so that the next generation and the next and the next will trust in God, remember what he has done, and obey what he has said. You want to put it very simply. And would not be stubborn and rebellious, right? Stubborn and rebellious means you hear, you know what you say, but I'm not going to do it anyway. Right? Stubborn, rebellious, and it's a heart and spirit thing because it's not just a head thing, right? Heart's not loyal to God, spirit's not faithful to him. That's why you need to do this. 
we have a covenant relationship with God just like Israel did. Where, um, well, what's a covenant relationship? Well, God always initiates. He'll come and say, I want to be your God. I choose you to be my people. I make you certain promises. And you can be sure I will carry them out. Right? It started with Abram hundreds of years earlier. Right? Um, God makes these promises. But he spells out the terms of the covenant, right? If you obey me, if you follow me, I will bless you. I'll protect you from your enemies. I'll make sure nobody comes within 20 feet or whatever of you. But if you do not, if you disobey, I will discipline you or I will curse you. I will make your enemies win. (laughs) Things like that, right? God spells it all out. He sets the boundaries. And that's what the law, the statutes are all about. That's how you make sure you fulfill your part as I fulfill my promises to you. So so that is a covenant relationship. We always respond. God is the one who initiates He makes promises, he does things, but he sets all the terms and the boundaries, and it depends on how we respond. We respond to what God has said and done. That's why it's important we know what's in Scripture. It's important that we count our blessings and not forget what God has done for us. Okay, so what did God do for his people? Well, if we summarize, he freed them from slavery. That was the Exodus part of Israel's history, right? They were over 400 years in Egypt, and, and, and now the pharaohs uh, feel threatened, and they're making them build all these uh, you know, pyramids and stuff, palaces for them. And after he freed them, there was this period they were in the wilderness um, where God guided and protected and provided and prepared them. Uh, actually, if you look at what Bible scholars uh, kind of say, it doesn't take that long to get to, from Egypt to, uh, to the promised land. I mean, God brought them to Sinai to receive the law, but there are many direct routes they could have taken but the people were not ready, right? Being, being slaves for so many years, they were not ready. So God was using this time to prepare them, even though we said that was their punishment too for lacking faith to, to, to go in at that point. Um, but that's what happened during that period. And then Psalm 78 very quickly touches on their arrival, the conquest and the settlement in, in Canaan. And that's all in the book of Joshua. Right? Where God empowered them, I mean, actually God fought the battles for them and, and drove out the people and, and God is like a, somebody, executor, settling all the inheritance stuff. You know, this tribe you get this, this tribe you get this, and, and, and settled them. Put them in houses they did not build, gave them fields they did not plant, vineyards, all that. So this is what God did for them. In other words, God acted as their savior, deliverer, Redeemer, God, during the wilderness period, was their shepherd. And, and in the conquest of Solomon, he was their commander-in-chief, fought the battles for them, and, and he basically executed the inheritance stuff for them through Joshua and the leaders. That's what God did for his people. These are the things that Asaph says, don't forget the deeds of the Lord. That's why we are here today. And I just want to pause for us. Does this relate to us? Yes, of course. When we came to Jesus for our faith, to put our faith in him, whether we grew up in a Christian home or we had a dramatic conversion, that was our exodus event. And, and, and friends, if you have not had the Exodus experience yet, 
Why not today? Jesus is only a prayer away, as they say. Right? Exodus. So, so don't forget that. And, and all of us have wilderness period where we are kind of lost. We don't know where we're going. We don't know when it'll end. <laughs> going in circles where God shepherded us. And I trust, of course, these things don't come so neatly in packages, right? They're all mixed together. And I'm sure we all had some experience of, 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 of conquering, of winning some battles and, 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 and settling in and having this peace and stability. Don't forget those things. And, that, and then don't forget all the terms that God laid out in his word for us to continue to be his people to be blessed by him. All right? So, so Psalm 78, verse 12 says, He did miracles in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, in the region of Zoan. It mentions seven of the ten plagues, which is God's judgment on Israel's oppressor, part of the terms of the covenant. If someone touch you, <laughs> I'm going to hit them back. If you... Do your part. If you respond to your part, love me and obey me, right? But I want us to note that all the first nine plagues didn't quite do the job, did they? Right? I mean, Pharaoh would get sick of all the mosquitoes and the frogs or all the whatever and say, okay, 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 tell your God to take this away and I'll let you go. And then once it's gone... Forget it. You guys are staying. <laughs> Nine times. And, you know, even God's people got so annoyed at Moses, right? He thought he was just leading Mahan and <laughs> pulling the line. Okay. It, not until the final one, which is a very serious, frightening, I mean, <laughs> no wiggle room. You're either dead or alive. And all the firstborn, not just uh, children, but their livestock, everything, all the firstborn, dead. And in the Israel part of town, all of the firstborn, son, animals, were alive. You remember why? Yeah, because they were protected by the Passover lamb, the blood that was smeared on the doorpost. Lots of meaning there. And of course, to, to do the job properly, God finished off Pharaoh's army <laughs> in the Red Sea to make sure that uh, you don't have to worry about season two or three. Because at the end of season one, kaput. No more chariots, no more horses. No, that's it. Okay, so when God, something, God does something, I mean, he leaves no holes and <laughs> cracks. Just, just does it. Good job, exactly. And don't forget that. That's what Asa was saying. And then, of course, they went to the wilderness. So to get a, kind of a taste of it, verse 20, 52 and 53. He brought his people out like a flock. And this is um, a contrast, right? He completely destroyed Pharaoh and his army, but he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the desert. And actually, at the end of Psalm 77, it says he did it through Moses and Aaron. And he guided them safely, so they were unafraid. Wow. As I mentioned earlier, wilderness means danger, unpredictability. You lack all the necessary stuff, right? You don't know where you're going to find water next or food, lone, time of loneliness. Wilderness means we need a shepherd who knows the way, who will guide and provide and protect, and again, when God does something, he does it thoroughly. How many years of training does, did Moses get to qualify, to, to even apply? Well, he didn't want to apply even, but God gave it to him anyway. Forty years. He had all the training in the palace of Egypt. He knows how to fight and all that. But he has no clue how to survive in the wilderness, in the desert. And God took 40 years to prepare this shepherd for them. Isn't that amazing? Actually, as I was preparing this uh, message, I was kind of 
you know, I, I don't camp. I, my son camps, so I was kind of interested. So I was browsing and see, do they have uh, some notes on how to survive, you know, in, 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 in the desert and all that? And I, I, I ran into this um, website of a company, Win, Winfield, in UK that sells all this equipment, and they had this article. And basically, I just pulled out sections of their article on how to survive in hot environment, and I, I line up some Bible verses from Psalm 78, okay? So the first thing they say is, take plenty of water with you. Uh, above 40 degrees Celsius, average person loses 900 mils of sweat every hour. Okay? <laughs> and look at verse 15. Because I, I didn't understand what's this big deal about God splitting rock. I mean, I know God gave them water. You know, he split the rocks in the desert and gave them water as abundant as not the ocean, but the seas. <laughs> much, <clears throat> much more than Pastor Jim's buckets. <laughs> now I know why, because they're losing buckets of sweat <laughs> every hour. Millions of them. And, and he brought streams out of a rock, rocky crag and make water flow like rivers. Now I said, oh, no wonder. You need that to survive. Okay, and not just that. Next section says, pack the right food, but don't eat it. Why? Because it'll make you thirsty. And pack foods that are full of nutrients and don't take up much space. Now, I would love to get hold of some manna. If we can. And I think if you do the analysis, it will be exactly what this is. It's full of nutrition does not suck water out of your system, and they don't have to pack it because it's new every morning, except on the Sabbath. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yet he gave a command to the skies above, opened the doors of heaven, he rained down manna for the people to eat, the grain of he heaven. No constipation. <laughs> no diarrhea, okay, grain of heaven. Uh, Men ate the bread of angels. That's why I have good grounds of making that statement. He sent them all the food they could eat. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And then there's a travel at night if you can. Why? Because, again, you've got to conserve your fluid. And, and be prepared for chilly nights because in the desert it gets very, very cold. And so I said, wow. God guided them with the cloud by day and with light from the fire all night. What else can you ask for? I would join this camping trip, would you? <laughs> There's the, that's the website, right? <laughs> These are straight out of there. And I, like I said, I just lined up some Bible verses that shows God is the best desert camp guide you can have. Wilderness wandering. We all go through wilderness period. Myself and Evelyn, our family, are still not out of that period. Uh, you know, we praise the Lord. Stephanie has finished all treatment, but it's not completely finished. Something was put on hold because there's some negative reaction. We don't know whether she'll be able to teach and how much she could do in September. So wilderness period are... Not good times to be in, but God promises his people, I'm going to be there with you. I'm going to be your shepherd. So with this kind of treatment, how did the people of God respond to all that he, he provided, he did for them? And closer to home, how do we respond? How have I been responding in my own story as the Lord shepherded my family and is still doing that through our wilderness experience. I just pause here and, and maybe give you a chance to think about your story, the wilderness experience you're going through right now, what the Lord has been doing for you, saying to you, reminding you of, and how you've been responding. One thing we learn here is that um, talk is cheap. 
The people even flattered God with their lips. If you read certain verses, but their hearts were not there. I trust that that's not true of us, as we think about this. Well, the people's response. Does that shock us? They continue to sin against God, rebelling in the desert against the Most High, and willfully putting God to the test. In spite of all this, they kept on sinning. In spite of His wonders, the manna, the cloud of fire, all of this stuff, the water that's gushing out to make sure they don't dehydrate. In spite of all of that, they did not believe. They said, "Well, give us this kind of food. We miss this kind of food. How about this food? Can you give it to us? We had that in Egypt." <laughs> yeah. So I use that to check my own story. How do I respond when? The good shepherd provides things that I really need, probably not what I want, <laughs> but what I needed the most. As I go through the wilderness experience, God's response was mercy, grace, and compassion. If we can summarize this, and and a, a, a snippet of that is in verse 37 to 39. Right, their hearts were not loyal to him. They were not faithful to his covenant. There is the things God were doing for them, the things God told them they need to do. As as his covenant children, yet he was merciful, ocean full merciful. He forgave their iniquities, did not destroy them. Well, some people got destroyed, but then a lot more people got spared. That's the point, and that's why First Corinthians ten says these are examples. God carries out His terms of the covenant, like a loving father. He does not let His children get away with anything, <clears throat> but it's always <clears throat> tempered with His mercy. Time, <clears throat> time after time, he restrained his anger, did not stir up his full wrath. He was compassionate. He remembered they were but flesh, passing breeze that does not return. And God still fulfilled His promise. He didn't say, "Forget it." <clears throat> he brought them to the border of the promised land, to the hill country His right hand had taken. And he drove out the nations before them, allotted the lands to them as an inheritance. See, God kept kept all His promises despite their rebelliousness. He settled the tribes of Israel in their homes. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, let's see if this helps. <laughs> Which bring us to the conquest, settlement. In the Promised Land, Psalm seventy-eight quickly kind of touches on this, but as we think about this, this is also true in our story, in your story, right? God needs to help us and empower us in our daily spiritual battles. He has provided the spiritual armor for us, and that's why it would be wise for us to put it on every day. In our spiritual battles, how has God empowered you in your spiritual battles? Which promises of God has been fulfilled in your life? As we say, these are all mixed together. But have you been experiencing a period of stability? And we give thanks and pray for two of the members of this church who are starting new jobs. I like the term passage. And they, one guy was trapped. <laughs> He had an exodus experience in his job because God liberated him from that taskmaster, so to speak. Right?、Um, steady income might might not be what you wish, but 
some stability, some semblance of peace and enjoyment. Right? That's in our story too. Are you going to share this with your children? Or if you don't have children, with those people who, who you are part of a group with? And, and, and give the glory and thanks to God and say, you know, I'm, I'm still facing a lot of challenges, but this is what God has done for us, for me. I think that's how this psalm relates to you and me. How do we respond to God when we have a taste of living in the promised land? It won't be everything you want, that's for sure. I'm sure some people, how come I got this house? How come I got this plot? I want that side. The sun's not on the right side. <laughs> Is that how I respond? Probably, you know, when I think about it. I don't want to be on this side. The sun's too hot. <laughs> well, the people's response. I hope it's not shocking you too much, but it should shock you, right? <laughs> They put God to the test. They rebelled against the Most High. This is after they settled in the promised land. You would think they would know better by this point in time that God means business and God fulfills all his promises. This is now the next generation because it's like their fathers. They were disloyal and faithless, as unreliable as faulty bow. They angered him. Now that they're settled down, they went to the hills and built all these things to the other gods of the people they drove, that God helped them drive out. You see, how could that be? Then I asked myself, could that be true of me? I might not literally go and build a grove or something, but do I make, now that I'm settled down, life is stable, do I now put all my hope in my career advancement, in building my retirement nest egg, and say, well, God, thank you. I think I can take, take it from here onward. Thank you for giving you know, a, a little start, but, but this is now getting a little bit complicated for, the, you know, for 2023 in the West Coast. They aroused God's jealousy with their idols. They angered him with their high places. You see, Israel knew its history and their law very well. But did it result in trust in God from the first to the next generation? Talking about the generation, what do you think? You could say, well, they were in the desert. They didn't have, <clears throat> they didn't have time to uh, teach their children, but I think they did because they had to celebrate Passover and all that, right? But I think our action speaks much louder than words, I think, right? The, the, the fathers were not faithful to God and the next generation kind of followed their example. And so as we think about Psalm 78, it's not just literally telling them. We've got to let them see it. We got to do it. Because Israel knew its history very well, but it did not result in, in all of this trust in God, remembering his deeds, keeping his commands. Rather, it resulted in stubbornness, rebelliousness, disloyal hearts, and unfaithful spirits. What went wrong? I think that's an important question. Right? Because I say, out of the three most important festivals that all Jewish guys will have to do their best to go to Jerusalem to celebrate, two of them would remind them of all this history. <laughs> the Passover in spring and the Feast of Booths or the tents, reminding them of the 40 years when they live in tents in the wilderness. Every year, they celebrate these. How could they not know it? How could they not know the history? And they certainly have to learn their law because when you're 13 years old, a Jewish guy, man, you become a man, and you're a quiz on this for your bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah too. Now, <laughs> they certainly knew it. 
That's why I say it's a heart problem. And so this morning, we have to just tell ourselves, too, it's a heart problem. We all know what Psalm 78 says, whether it's 72 verses or double that or half that. We know that, I believe, if you've been going to Sunday school and church. Right? How about us? We have experienced God's grace and mercy. Whatever stage of life we're in, however it felt like, whether it's the Exodus one, whether it's the wilderness, whether it's the settlement in the promised land, we have experienced God's mercy and grace and compassion. Do I trust in God this morning? Am I ready to share what he has done, his deeds? Am I keeping his commands? For example, tithing, because everything belongs to the Lord. You know, so, so th- this really relates to me in a very personal way. Or am I stubborn and rebellious, disloyal, unfaithful? These are all heart things, spirit things. What went wrong? Interestingly, Asaph, I think, was a realist when he composed this. And that's why he says, hear my teaching, listen to the words of my mouth. But he knew that this is old stuff. He already said, things we have heard and known, things are, you know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know. Ah, but verse 2 says, I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things. I'm telling you history you all know, but I'm going to do it in the shape and form of a parable. And I'm going to tell you hidden things. So let's just pause for a moment to see maybe we can find a clue of what Asaph is actually trying to do here with this psalm. Because, because obviously things went wrong. <laughs> well, he had two generations to prove it. And we don't know when he wrote this psalm, but things didn't get better. <laughs> psalm 78 is a parable. Parable means it's a story meant to make us do something about it. That's why Jesus used parables. A parable with hidden things. Parables are stories that pull us into it. You know, like you you hear the story of the prodigal son. You might identify with the father. You might identify with the, the prodigal. You might identify with the brother. It pulls us into the story. But it requires imagination and careful examination to unlock the meaning. And that's the the, the beauty of parable, using wisdom teaching. Not just tell you what to do, but pull you into the story and allow you to say, hmm, who am I like? You know, what should I do? The hidden things, very interesting. It's translated hidden things, NIV, dark sayings. Uh, hidden lessons, riddles. What does that mean? Well, I, it's hidden because in our familiarity with the story, we've missed them. When I was thinking about this, you know, in my younger days, we used to play hide and seek. That was an exciting, exciting game. I don't know if people still play that. And, 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 and you know that they're somewhere here in the room, but they're hidden. You just can't think of it. Maybe you didn't think they could squeeze into that little space. <laughs> hidden. And, and Asaph wants us to be drawn into this history, make that our own story, and see what we have missed. It's there all along. It's there all along. For example, earlier I just said, well, yeah, if, if the parents didn't do it, no matter how hard they taught their children, I'm not surprised that their children repeated <laughs> what they've done. Rebellious and all that. And forgot about all that God has done for them. Right? Them showing their children and grandchildren would have made a big difference. On top of teaching them the law and telling them all these stories and going to all the festivals with all the celebration. 
So as we come to an end, parables with hidden things. Aesop wants us to realize all the implications and apply it to our lives this morning. Not just to rehash history, even though some of us love history. That's not going to do anything. And because we are in a covenant relationship with God, we could be sure, because Psalm 78 shows so clearly that God always keeps his word. He, whatever he does is going to be praiseworthy, full of his power and amaze us and those around us. There's no question about that. It all depends on how we respond to what God has told us in his word and what God has done for us. That's the, the key part. That's the part I kind of realize. There's no problem on that side. <laughs> If something went wrong, don't spend time looking that side. Spend time checking my own story. Check our story to see what have we missed. And so some very practical questions for us to reflect on before we end this morning is, do you see Psalm 78 as your story? Not just Israel's history. Have you experienced God as your savior in the Exodus event? or events of your life. It's not a once, once, you know, once event. How has God been leading you through your wilderness experience? Has God allow you to enjoy some promised land experience? How have you responded to God's grace, mercy, compassion, faithfulness. I do this not because we want to beat ourselves up, because God knows how weak we are. And that's why Jesus came to the cross. Not to beat ourselves up, but to realize that God, knowing full well how weak and frail we are, That's why he showered us with his grace and mercy and compassion. And that's why his mercy are new every morning, to give us a fresh start. But we still have to respond. You still have to go pick the manna up. <laughs> right? You still have to pick double portion the day before Sabbath. And for some smart Alec who thought he could take a week's worth, you're going to get the maggots. Okay? God means what he says. No fooling around. But he'll always fulfill his part. It depends on how we respond. And of course, this morning, uh, if God is not your savior yet, that's, yeah, why not today? <laughs> so that he could also be your shepherd, provider, protector, commander, legal advisor, <laughs> all of that. He wants to be all of that. That's part of his covenant terms. But he has also spelled out very clearly what our part will be in the covenant. And that's why we need to spend time reviewing and reading his word too. Because memory does not always serve us well. And we tend to sometimes think God said that, but maybe he didn't quite say it like that. That's when Satan can really play tricks on us. All right? So how have I, how have you been responding to his grace, mercy, and love and compassion? And do we share these wonderful stories and what we're learning with our children, grandchildren, 
and, and, and those in our circle of friendship and confidence. I think that's what ASAP means. Don't hide them. Don't hide them. Tell it so that the people around you, the next generation, the next generations, will know God and trust him and honor him and obey him. So I've just tried to help us unlock some of these hidden lessons that were really applicable to me. And I trust that you unlock some other stuff because that's what a parable with hidden things is meant to do. Immerse yourself in that story, see how it fits with your own story, and see what we've been missing. It's, it's all here. <laughs> it's all there. Pay attention. Pay attention. Again, you know, the contrast couldn't be any more marked. Again, words are cheap. <laughs> it's when we obey and put it into action. And no matter how feeble our attempt, God loves that, and he will honor that, and he will continue to help us. Don't say, oh, this is too much. Uh, There's no way possible. No, God says, I'm going to empower you. Right? The conquest and all that, that's all it's. And, of course, Psalm 78 ends on a high note, right? Uh, although it, it covers a lot of things there. Uh, we, it skipped over some really gory parts when God allowed his ark to be captured. The, the, the tabernacle at Shiloh, which is part of the territory of Ephraim, to be demolished and all the priests killed. That's pretty gory stuff in 1 Samuel 4 or 5. Uh, but this psalm refers to that too. But the important part is you see how sovereign, that's another term, sovereign God is because at this point God says enough. I'm going to transfer the leadership for Israel from the tribe of Ephraim, which is Joseph's tribe, to the tribe of Judah. And again, this is God's sovereignty because Judah is no good guy either. <laughs> if you know your history, he's no good guy. He's a dirty scoundrel too. And that's why it's all God's grace. But God is sovereign. So at this point, he rejected the tents of Joseph, did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. Instead, he chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem. And he built his sanctuary like the heights like the earth he established forever. And he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people. Shepherd again. It was Moses, Aaron, Joshua, the judges after Joshua. Saul was not that great. And now God chose David. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. True. It ended on a high note, right? What's missing? David, like you and me, was flawed too. Extremely flawed. He abuses privilege too. But the saving grace is he does not try to rationalize and hide it. He openly admits it and just entrusts himself to God's mercy and grace. He confessed openly. And that's, I think, one of the other hidden stuff here, too. You know, he, David is so highly spoken of, and, and rightly so, because that was the high point. But you know what happens, right? After David, Solomon, and soon the kingdom split into north and south. And there are more bad kings than good kings. <laughs> and God kept the terms of the covenant, exile, all the prophet books. But then God kept his promise and brought them back. But the people continued to chase after idols, and 400 years of silence, God did not speak until John the Baptist appeared in the New Testament. Anyway, that's a lot of history. But I just want you to see that that's the big 
picture. And of course, what's not there is the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which really should be there. If I could just, you know, it's not just a, 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 a timer waiting for something. It's waiting for the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords to come back. And amazingly, that's not the end of the story either. That's just the beginning of the best part of the story, you see? Um, anyway, I get excited because, you see, the Bible is God's grand redemptive story. In our stories, God invites us to kind of insert it into this grand, grand, overarching story. And he's sovereign, yeah, and, and, and you say, okay, the laws and the stuff, how do we apply it today? We don't, have the, we don't have to follow the diet of the Jews anymore. Well, the stuff we face today are way complex and complicated. And the, with the AI and the chat bot and all that, it's getting more and more complicated, complex. You know, and scripture will not give us a verse or a, a, a passage to, to face m many of the issues we face today. But the broad principles are there in the Ten Commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. If we just put that into action, would I do this if my neighbor was me? <laughs> Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the broad principle. But if I do this, I'm going to be taken as a doormat and a fool. Then God says, well, do you trust me? What do I promise those who love me and keep my commands? I will protect them. I will honor them. I will bless them. I guess there's a good way of testing God, and there's a bad way of testing God. Depends which way we choose. Okay, time to end. So, we can make our decision based on the fact that God is sovereign. You see? He's continuing to work out his plans and purposes despite our failures and faithfulness. I just jumped from Israel history to, to our, our stories now because they're actually the same in my mind. David failed. Moses kind of failed too. He didn't get to even go in, right? All the other kings failed, led to the exile, and then they came back. And But God is still fulfilling his purposes, right? Because at the right time, God's only son, Jesus Christ, came. And he masterminded and executed the greatest exodus event on the cross, he smashed the head of Satan, just like that first prophecy said in Genesis 3.15, giving all of us now a chance to be free from the bondage to Satan and sin, right? The perfect Passover lamb, because God's wrath was fully unleashed on Jesus Christ. And with that, the perfect and final shepherd of our soul. Not to lead us to the promised land, but to lead us to the promised eternal home, which is also part of God's covenant, which is beautifully described in the last book of the Bible, Revelation. So, that's my point. This is God's big, big story not yours, not mine, but God invites us to insert our stories, your story, my story, into this big, big story, if we're willing. And don't worry whether you're able to or not. You just, God just needs the heart. He will provide and he will help us. One step at a time. And God knows we're going to fail because he knows we are, we are but flesh. And that's why there's confessional. Anyway, I can go on. But, but this, I believe, is the lessons 
the Holy Spirit wants us to gain from Israel's history because it's also our history. We need to share it. We need to tell it. But most importantly, we need to live it. Let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for your living word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that uh, you speak to us through your word and the wonderful deeds that our Lord Jesus has done for us. Thank you that many of us have experienced the Exodus experience. We have gone through wilderness, perhaps even right now we are in it. And you've given us a taste of the promised land. All to invite us to continue to trust you and to obey the terms you have set out for us to live this life, to make our lives meaningful, to insert our stories into your bigger story, to have a part in what you're doing, to accomplish your plans and purposes, not just for us, but for our world, your eternal redemptive plan. Thank you. Help us to see our lives in light of this big, big story, this big, big God, this God with unlimited infinite mercy, grace, and love. And Lord, you have proven it again and again that you are trustworthy, even though we are not. And so give us the courage and the desire to respond accordingly. For I ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.